I wanted to make a special announcement today. Bright Digit is setting up a brand new Patreon page. That's right, you can become a member of a fan of Bright Digit and the content that I've put together, whether it's the podcast, uh, episodes, videos, articles, even some of the code that I've been working on and get the inside scoop and early access to that. Um, you've been a great fan of this content and it would be super uh, helpful to me. Uh, but also it gives you an opportunity to just get early access and ask me any questions about some of the content interviews. Maybe you can suggest some questions for future guests and get the inside track on what the recording schedule is. Uh, and you'll get access to the Slack as well. So we'll set up a fans uh, Slack channel for you to join in. So take uh, just think about it if you can, you know, put some money together and support this channel and the content that I've put together. I'd really appreciate it. Um, and I just want to hear from you. Uh, if you've been a fan, I'd love for you to join our uh, membership as well. Thank you so much for watching and just being a fan of this content. It's really been an inspiration to me. That's all I had to say. That was our special announcement. Um, go ahead and enjoy the rest of the show. Welcome to another episode of Empower Apps. Today, I'm joined by Via Fairchild. Via, thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure. I'm happy to be here. Uh, before we get started, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, so I'm Via Fairchild, also known as Coding MILF on Twitter and Mastodon. <laughs> I, <laughs> I do post semi-professionally. It just was a gimmicky username that worked, so we're rolling with it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we met in Chicago last year at Deep Dish. Mm -hmm. Um, you're a prolific Twitter person and, uh, as far as like showing your, your coding skills and stuff. So I'm super happy to finally get you on. Um, and I'm excited about what we're going to talk about today. Um, diversity and accessibility. I'm in the middle of testing my app for accessibility features and stuff. Um, what? What kind of like got you interested uh, specifically in accessibility? Well, the fact that I didn't know about it. And then one day somebody was talking about, um, you know, what were they comparing it to? Uh, UI testing and how it can also be helpful for accessibility. I was like, what is that? And, you know, that's a very privileged statement <laughs> to say, <laughs> I don't know what this is for accessibility. And so um, that was at the very beginning of my apprenticeship at Big Nerd Ranch. And from there, I was always just asking, what is this? It just kind of seemed like this um, nice to have elusive idea because it's not considered a core of uh, development. You know, it's it, as a junior developer in the growing sense uh, and um, and self-taught, I've never seen it brought up, which was really disheartening once I started learning more of really what it is. And right. I went into a position where they tried to meet ADA standards and above because they're a nationwide news and internet outlet. Um, so thankfully they had some internal standards that they were uh, bringing their current app to and then just uh, their, their brand new features, they were starting it from the bottom. They weren't like having to backtrack too much. So that was nice to see. And then just poking around on apps with my voiceover and dynamic text and realizing how many things are very broken. I was like, man, we need, we need, a, we need to whip this into shape, the whole industry, and we've got a lot mm -hmm. to learn. Yeah, I mean, I'll give credit where credit's due. Apple usually tends to be pretty good about, like, telling people about all the accessibility features and um, kind of just letting people know about like that hey accessibility is important what do you think like so apparently like you started off like many of us not knowing what accessibility is what are some maybe misnomers or mis uh mischaracterizations that people don't get about what accessibility uh is and what it means for mobile ios developers like ourselves well in the sense of um it, i guess maybe voiceover it, it really is just another line or two of code more, more often than not. I think sometimes it can be overwhelming with thinking, wow, there's this whole 
world I'm unfamiliar with that I need to cater to, which we should hopefully be just doing that anyways. But, mm -hmm. but there could maybe be, I, I had the idea that there is so much that I need to work into the app to make this usable for, for dynamic text and voiceover. And it, it sometimes can get a bit complicated with the UI for dynamic text, um, but that's worth the effort, I think, and it's a lot of good learning. <laughs> but specifically with voiceover, it's usually just adding on some accessibility traits, which which is not that hard if you know what, what to look for. We just maybe need to spend some more time on researching that generally. So is most of your accessibility work in UI kit or Swift UI? UI kit. I okay. my last position was focused UI kit and and that was it was between Zib, Storyboard and Programmatic. So it was a mix okay. of all of that. And that's okay that you said Storyboard. We'll allow that on this podcast. <laughs> um but like what what is what are some like 101 or what are some first things people should do when they're adding accessibility to their app? Well, the nice thing is if you're if you're working in Storyboard, you can see there's usually accessibility traits predetermined and marked active for you, like for a button. Um, so it'll read such and such button, and it'll notify the user that it's a you know interactive feature. Um, okay. So you can change that, or you can at least make sure it's on. Um, and let's see, what was the original question? I got excited to talk about that. <laughs> Well, just like what, like what are some first things you should do if you're going to set up accessibility in your app um, oh. when you're using UI kit? Yes. Yeah. I, I would say just learn the traits and spend a few days with your phone on voiceover. Cause it took me okay. a good minute to learn the touch gestures, how to understand three finger swipe or like the ro no, rotator no, no. selector. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Can you hear my background? Yes. That's fine. Don't worry okay. about it. <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. I've heard worse. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, what are, I, I actually don't know what the accessibility traits are. Or what should, what are they and what should I know about? Oh man, I'm trying to think of all the ones from what I worked with. So the most common ones that I can recall are like headers. So you want a header to announce what is what is on the page, right? So you've got an article. So you've got article title, and maybe there's a button for, I don't know, maybe there's a video feature, right? So you've got okay. article title, a video feature, and then a button to view more or something. And so it's like key points of what's on your app screen in front of you. So you can just click through really quick or tap through really. Right. And um, it's just giving you the main highlights of what's on the screen. And then you can go further from there. You can do more detailed descriptions and you can, oh, okay. you have to be a bit more careful with like truncation. Like if there's a, you know, an article summary, you have to make sure you're adding the right uh, voiceover traits for that to make sure it's not reading the whole thing or, you know, giving a glimpse of what you actually want the user to see or hear. That's really interesting because I've been, so I've been doing a lot of Swift UI work lately in Mac OS uh, for my app, Bushel. Mm -hmm. And um, like Swift UI actually is really good. They've done a lot with accessibility um, as far as like labels and things like that. And there's the accessibility audit app, which is amazing and super helpful. Um, but there's like is this that, accessi say that again. Is that different than their accessibility inspector? Or sorry, accessibility inspector. That's accessible. Oh, it is that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then with that app, you can do the audit and then you could also do the audit now with UI tests as well, which is amazing. Um, but I noticed the accessibility header and I'm like looking at it and it's got like H1, H2, like all these HTML based tags. And I'm like wondering what the heck it means. And now that makes a lot more sense. It's like a way to like organize your content in such a way for mm -hmm. voiceover. Right. So, right. yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. The priority for the user. Okay. Okay. That makes total sense. What are like, so we, we went over voiceover. What other like accessibility features should people know about besides uh, what people use like voiceover, I guess. One of the things that I thought was very 
painful but also very educational <laughs> was like an onboarding screen. A lot of okay. onboarding series have really beautiful graphics and once you turn on dynamic text it it breaks them terribly and a lot of the time if you don't have a scroll view in it you can't get down to the continue or the submit button because it's so blown up and so you're literally stuck in onboarding and then your app is quite unusable so <laughs> that was kind of a hard realization me, of like <laughs> can you tell me what apps are like that that. Oh, well, the one I was working on, we had um, Spectrum News, which we fixed it. Okay. That, that was my ticket. We fixed the onboarding. Okay. <laughs> but it's really like you just need to put it in a scroll view, which you wouldn't think of because it's like, you know, default text. It's just fine, right? right. It's right. displaying beautifully. But once you take it all the way to that top uh, font accessibility, and it's just totally up, blown up because it needs to be, and and it's stuck. You know the okay. constraints are are just set to what they are. There's uh, and the with that too, you have to make sure. Oftentimes, this is more of a design preference, but you want your um, image to scroll up with the text beneath it. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense? <laughs> yep. Yeah, no, no, I totally get it. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. hard to verbally, I'm like, I can see it in my head. You scroll <laughs> and. <laughs> welcome, welcome to the world of podcasting. Um, so, yes. um, yeah, I, I keep forgetting about dynamic text. text. That's a really good one. Mm -hmm. um, the other one I think about is like one handedness. Like if you only have one hand. Like, I don't know about you. I'm an Apple Watch user, but there's always using the nose to touch your Apple Watch screen because your hands are full. Like, there's always things like that that I think accessibility offers that we often don't think about. Um, but, yeah, that's a really good point. So we cover traits, covered headers, voiceover, dynamic type. What else when it comes to accessibility? I guess, are there any, like, steps you would take? if you're gonna run an app and be like, okay, let's test this out. Mm -hmm. So you would enable things like voiceover, I guess. You'd play around with dynamic text. There's right. accessibility inspector running an audit and that. What what other tools should people know about, I guess? Uh, I, would, I would put a gentle caution about accessibility inspector just okay. because it is super out of date. They haven't sent out any updates for a while, so sometimes it can break. Okay. And, it might seem, especially if you're running in the simulator um, for voiceover perhaps or something, it, it might give you mixed feedback for what is actually functioning or not in code. So I would just suggest maybe doing the uh, the, the, the hard code, like the, the device itself if you can. Um, okay. I'd okay. love for Apple to, to update that, but it, it's right. okay. <laughs> <laughs> it makes um, sense it's a back burner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What other tools then maybe besides those? I think just or settings in in the iPhone that you should be enabling <laughs> to test it out. <laughs> I I would definitely make sure you know how to turn off voiceover before turning <laughs> it on. <laughs> if you're going to be in public, yeah, that would be good. Yeah, yeah, I think um honestly just from my experience, there could be better ways and I'm totally open to hear them, but I think the best way is to just act as as the user would if if you're testing dynamic test uh, text just have it cranked up and and test it on all spectrums of the font you know it goes down to really itty bitty to big and you want to make sure that just for you know for UI reasons as well as uh, accessibility that it's reasonable to navigate um, but yeah definitely spending time with your phone on voiceover and be prepared to be bothered with how much it reads out to you if the screen lights up it always is like oh it's you know 1400 and it's so many degrees outside so i had to keep the uh dimmer off like just let it always stay on because okay. it would bother me every time i would go to test something i'm like oh i could imagine it's yes. impossible to get into it yeah yeah <laughs> Um, have you done anything with accessibility in Swift UI? No, but I was looking at it, and it seems like it's got a lot of things for free, which is really nice. Okay. 
one thing like I've done recently is really, especially since I'm doing like, what's great is if you're doing UI testing, you, it works with the accessibility stuff. So like the better mm -hmm. your app is accessible, the better it works with UI tests. So for instance, yes. uh, accessibility identifiers, like mm -hmm. I just, I've been putting those like crazy all over my app. So that way I can start saying, click here, do this, do that. And then running the audits. Um, we talked about that in the episode with uh, poll, but just like now you can run a whole accessibility audit and like, it'll tell you, oh, this color is not the right contrast or this button is too oh, small, wow. too big, things like that. And it's been amazing. Um, and it's been great working with SwiftUI with that stuff. It's not, um, SwiftUI definitely has, has gotten a lot better uh, in the last year or so and, and it shows um, that's fantastic yeah, yeah that, i've taken a year off from it so i should jump back into it more yeah yeah understandably um yeah and the, i don't know if you've ever done ui testing but if you're doing anything with ui testing like if you have good you like accessibility then the ui tests are just so much easier as far as getting that working and like saying okay click this button do this do that and then yeah so anyway just i can't plug that enough um that's exciting yeah it is it is um, what else do you want to talk about when it comes to accessibility? Oh, just that maybe it would be wonderful if, if we considered it a part of developer foundations, especially for self-taught. I think, uh, I think we have to go out of our way to learn about it and to, um, suggest integrating it into yeah. work. And I think slowly that's shifting, but I'd like to see a little bit more energy around pushing that through to just the community. Yeah. I think we have some some uh, some role models, some social, uh, what's the word I want to use, you know, just role models in the industry that are trying to push it more, and I think that that's really helping sway the, the attention. Otherwise, I wouldn't be very aware of it myself. Right, right. I mean, Apple does do a good job. I mean, they always have a few talks on it. Yes. Um, like, That's I think... It's kind of like hearing your mom talk about it, you know? Like, yes, mom, I know I need to clean my room, but... <laughs> <laughs> I think, like, honestly, what it comes down to, like, with all this stuff is, like, money is, like, if a business is willing to pay a developer to do it, then, mm -hmm. yeah, it's going to become more important in the industry. And I do think it's shifting that way. It just it has to... Because, uh, you know, we have a wider audience than we used to mm -hmm. when it comes to technology. And I think it's great. Um, like the ADA stuff that you have to implement um, with what you were talking about. Like as long as the, like the businesses are starting to shift that way, um, the technology is already there. Like you said, Apple or even like we can talk about web development. But even in web development, like there is a lot of the right attributes, whatever, or the right JavaScript code that you need to do to make your website accessible. So I think businesses are shifting in that direction. Yes, yeah, it's quite interesting. One of the clients at Big Nerd Ranch, it was a very, very large client, and they were backtracking to integrate accessibility to avoid, uh, you know, being sued. Yep. <laughs> Which I think is where a lot of apps are, unfortunately. Yeah. So hopefully industry, you know, the industry giants will say, oh, look, we need to just start from the bottom with this, not backtracking at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and like we've said, it's like accessibility isn't just, you know, we always think of the most extreme cases of, you know, somebody's blind or somebody doesn't mm -hmm. have the ability to use their hands or something like that or deaf or things like that. But I think there's a fine gradient, too. It's like. You know, uh, we did that episode with Casey talking about the, the different kind of permanent, temporary, and situational issues. Um, you know, arm injury or ear infection. You know, the small parts, not not the big drastic parts that can be um, temporary. So yeah, it's uh, it's good to keep the that term. Mind. Yeah, the term uh, universal. Uh, what's it called? Universal accessibility. I think that's the term. You know, like having. Um, um, curb drops for the strollers and yes. the wheelchairs. It's yes. for everybody. Yeah, what's that yeah, called? There's, Hold on, there's I'm gonna look that up. That. Okay, thank you. Universal, universal something. Uh, 
Universal design is the design of buildings or products or environments to make them accessible to people regardless of age, disability, or other factors, addresses common barriers for participation, and things that can be used by the maximum number of people possible. Post a link to that in the doc when you get a chance. It's good to know. Yeah. The thing actually, what I was looking up was the curb cut effect, where it's like oh, okay. the idea being like the curb cut or um, is not, it's originally for people in wheelchairs, but it's helpful to everyone. Um, like yes. we said, like baby strollers, dollies, whatever it is like. Um, and I think that's another thing to think about is going back to my whole rant about UI testing is like, if you start implementing this stuff in accessibility, like there's benefits outside of just um, making it accessible to everyone. UI tests right. or just somebody is temporary dis temporarily disabled, uh, it becomes valuable to them as well. So, yeah. Absolutely. So if you need to like, well, I guess I'll ask you, if you need to sell accessibility to your client or the company you work for, I mean, that's one way of doing it, right? Yeah, the general, the the universal diversity, the yeah. universal accessibility. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally, totally. Um, cool. Anything else or should we talk about diversity more? I feel like it all goes together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all about love and acceptance, kumbaya. Yeah. <laughs> we need it. <laughs> you want to? Yeah, go ahead. Expand upon that. I guess. What do you? What do you think? What do you mean? It goes together. Well, okay. So I was just I was just interviewing with a gentleman who he's 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 blind himself. He's a blind web developer, okay. and he was talking about making a greenfield app as an example for um, just for high quality accessibility. Um, so, so maybe that'll pan out eventually, but again, funding. <laughs> so one thing that we were talking about, which I really appreciate was the, um, idea of having a diverse team to really drive home the accessibility of the app, because when you have a diverse team, you get so many angles. And he was talking about, um, you know, wanting to get more blind developers on the team and more women, just people uh, of underprivileged. And I think of like all of these, all of these minorities that are very slowly finding their footing in the tech world. And there's a lot of wonderful um uh, organizations out there to support it, but it's it's really wild to see how much of an uphill battle it is. <laughs> like when we we were at that um, conference earlier this year, the, the Swift point point one <laughs> one one point <0. laughs> um, Josh did a fantastic job with his lineup of speakers and diversity, and I just can't. I just can't applaud him enough for that. But it was so interesting to be on stage and to see a sea of white gentlemen, <laughs> which is totally fine and normal and expected. Mm -hmm. But it's also like, you, like there's a group of gals and we all got excited and did a dinner. And it was, I think, a total of maybe 20 women okay. or so uh, in about 300 gentlemen that were attending the yeah. conference, which was funny because we're celebrating that we're excited about the growing number yeah, yeah. right but a percentage comparison is just offbeat still yeah <laughs> do you i mean what, what do you think are the barriers to why that is currently as low as it is oh god that's i could talk about that for hours alone <laughs> <laughs> well I don't know, like I just went to a career day at my son's elementary school and um, I think it really starts there. Just what we're teaching our children and uh, conformities for for how we think brains work for girls versus yeah. boys. And um, I think there are some fundamental things like I'm watching my son go through some difficulties in school. And I'm like, OK, I think this might might just be because of how he was DNA created. Right. Um but I think at the same time, 
there was a, there was a little girl who came up after one of my sessions and she was like your job is so cool I want to be like you and she's wearing cute pink frilly yeah. stuff and I it was so heartwarming but it's also like man I hope I hope that she'll be um like I hope that there will be people to support that further mm -hmm. you know I'm coming from a background of of cosmetics ironically okay. so very female well can i ask <laughs> how did you go career. from uh, cosmetics to um you know opening up xcode i was tired of being poor okay to be frank right right i mean that's i mean <clears throat> okay i'm just gonna keep probing it if that's okay but like uh why yeah. why why mobile development i guess or why even ios like um, why specifically ios development mm -hmm. That's really what fell into my lap. Okay. I, I was very unaware of the world of tech. And when I talked to a friend of mine, he was like, this is what I do. I'll mentor you. Let's right, do right, it. Right. And so I just put all my eggs in one basket. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And that's, it, that's interesting. Um, I'm just trying to go backwards to probe the, the question about why is like, were you like, were you ever interested in technology or development before? Um, I think in it. ways that don't directly compare. Okay. Like I have a unfinished degree in like event okay. planning and a small business. And so putting the pieces together of a bigger project, that's something that was really satisfying to me. So I think in an indirect way, it kind of compares to the joys I find in development okay. because I can find those more detailed, uh, those detailed things that need attention and pull it into the bigger project. So I don't think it, it, there's never really been any point in my life where I'm like, computers are so fantastic. I want to spend my life working on them until recently. <laughs> But yeah, it's been a big adjustment in that sense. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Um. Yeah, it's just interesting to me, like people's stories and where where they get where they're going. Like, obviously, there's a lot of money in software development that makes sense. Like, there's just <laughs> yeah. demand, regardless of um, you know, there's just there's always a demand out there for that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and it's just like. <clears throat> I think part of it is like, I think it's, it's going to get better. Like, I, I don't, I think the trajectory is going to continue to go up, but it's like, it's your social circle, right? If your social circle get, brings mm -hmm. you awareness of it and, and, you know, yes. things like that, I think that's going to be super helpful. Um, yeah. I mean, as a dad, it lights my heart. Anytime my, my second grader says she's interested in what I'm working on. I'm just like, yes, yeah, please. Like, I could go mm -hmm. on this all day and then, you know, they get bored because they're sick of dad talking about it. But still, it like, it does <laughs> light my heart um, whenever they're interested in it. So, yeah, I totally, mm -hmm. totally get it. Um, what do you, like, I guess, what do you see as ways of encouraging your kids and maybe your daughter specifically to pursue software development? Well, I think now, generally, the world of tech has kind of clued in to needing to level out a bit. So there's some really great tools for children, like Scratch Playgrounds is growing more and more. Um, I keep hearing about this this computer I'm thinking about getting for my son. Can okay. a computer? It's basically a children's version where you build the computer and then you can code on it from from what i've that sounds understood really cool. oh canna with a k all right we'll put that in the notes yes that's very cool yeah okay yes and just the idea that you know even down to like gaming is you know gender equality <laughs> i think i think since the start of the industry really early 90s it's like been very boy yep. focused except for maybe tamagotchis right, right, right. <laughs> So it's good to see that slowly leveling out. And I think that's really where, I mean, it's going to continue to grow as ground up. But there's a lot of support for adult women as well. And I, I think just in hiring process, there's a lot that can be grown to make yeah, that available. Agreed. agreed. Um, yeah. What Do you have any links or recommendation, recommended resources um, for folks like yourself, as far as like helping women and in the industry? 
Yeah, yeah, there's a couple of them I'll send your way for the uh, okay. show notes. Um, off the top of my head, Underdog Devs with Rick Walter, I think is how yeah. his last yep. name said. He, he focuses on underprivileged and um, formerly yep. incarcerated. So there's a lot of people that can fit into that uh, yep. that world, which it can be life-changing if you fit in there. So he's got an amazing thing going. Um, I'm in a Slack channel called Women in Tech, or Women Who Code, and there's a lot of uh, resources there that I'll send your way as well. But there, if you look for it, you'll find it. Even in my local... Um, my local iOS developer Slack community, there's a channel for women, and I think I'm about the only <laughs> one. <laughs> but every once in a while, I'll see a, a female, and I, I almost think I startle them. I'm like, oh, my God, a woman. And they're like, oh, what's your name? <laughs> but I just get so excited. I'm like, female, yay. So yeah. yeah, That's awesome. Via, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm glad to have a chat yeah, with you. Thank you. Yeah, where can people find you online? I spend most of my time on a uh, Twitter X yeah. still. <laughs> um, I do have a Mastodon account that I'm still getting used to. Um, otherwise, you can reach out to me on an email or LinkedIn. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, it's been great. People can find me on Wonderful. Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it uh, at Leo G. Dion. Uh, Leo G. Dion at C.IM on Mastodon. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn. Um, we also have just set up a Patreon page. So if you uh, love episodes like this, uh, I would love your support. We'll have a link to that in the show notes for Bright Digit. Um, companies Bright Digit, please also take some time, like and subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube or post a review on your podcast player if you really like this episode. Thank you so much, and I look forward to talking to everybody later. Thank you. Bye.